Welcome to St. Paul's and our anniversary service this week. We, as usual, are doing it in our virtual kind of way for folks with Nellie and I here on one day with Rick and Blair and the musicians here on another day. And today we have a special guest, Reverend Bill Phipps uh, from Calgary is going to come and join us during the sermon time via Zoom. And so a whole new level of experimentation with using our technology. We appreciate Bill who has been with us throughout our journey at St. Paul's as we've transformed into being a center. He has offered comment and encouragement, and so we look forward to his message today. We have extended phone calls out to everybody in the community this last week as part of our anniversary celebration, saying hello and uh, asking if you want to have follow-up phone calls. If somehow you've been missed, please let us know because we'd love to be in touch keeping our circle together as part of the St. Paul's community. We are gathering as a worship committee on Tuesday night to work with Rick and analyze how we've been doing in our virtual services. And so if you want to offer feedback, uh, suggestions, critiques, we'd welcome that as part of our ongoing evolution and how worship will continue to evolve even when we gather again in the sanctuary. On Wednesday nights, as we did this last week, we've gathered for passing of the peace. You can phone in, you can come by a computer. Uh, all are welcome. It's an informal time of conversation. This is part of our ongoing life and ministry at St. Paul's. Welcome to this anniversary service, this service as the third week in the Easter season, the season of opening ourselves to what resurrection means in this time, what it means to come alive to the spirit, to be transformed, to be awakened to a new reality. We offer this lighting of the solidarity candle, the rainbow candle of diversity that invites all to come to this time of worship. On this anniversary Sunday, we celebrate our coming together in our 189th year. 
from early beginnings and the missionaries arriving in Lake Simcoe through to this digital age where we come to you via the internet. Over these many generations, St. Paul's has been a serving presence in this community, and we continue in that tradition. So let us worship, let us hold each other in our prayers and our thoughts, let us raise our voices in song and offer a virtual hug as part of this, this time of worship. Let us worship together. Rejoicing, sing praise to the Lord. Praise God for marvelous things. Break forth, break forth into joy. With songs of with songs of rejoicing, sing praise to the Lord. Praise God for marvelous things. And the hills sing for joy. The seas with their roaring speak praise to God's name. With songs of rejoicing, with songs of rejoicing, sing praise to the Lord. Praise God for marvelous things. Break forth, break forth into joy. Rejoicing, oh praise God, come make a joyful noise, sing to the Lord, Alleluia, sing Alleluia.
time this past Wednesday night reminiscing with folks about St. Paul's and the many anniversaries that have happened here over the 189 years. I was asking folks in the passing of the peace time to offer some reflections on what it meant to be members of St. Paul's. Some said that they couldn't offer reflections because they were, re they were relatively newcomers to St. Paul's. They'd only been here for about 30 years or so. I guess that means in my six years, I've just walked in the door to St. Paul's. So it was fun to hear from those folks who have been around for a while about the change in formality to informality. Many commented on predecessors uh, ministers that had strict uh, dress attire and formality in worship services with processions and a strict dress code for those serving communion. So I guess one of the vestiges of that for us today is our choir members still wear gowns. Uh, and even I guess I do on communion Sundays when I put on my Geneva gown, a time of more formal coming together. But in this day and age, we've become much less formal, haven't we? Uh, some would even think that by having Nellie the dog up here, that we've gone to the dogs by our informality as we've come together. Bay was remembering back in the 50s when the young peoples ventured to ask the board if they could have a dance. Of course not, the board replied. No such thing could happen here in a Protestant church. Uh, I think in this day and age, the leadership team would be the first to initiate a dance at St. Paul's, so times have changed. Mary Town was remembering one Sunday when a member was so outraged that she came down the aisle up on to the chancel here and told the minister that he was wrong. Well, in this day and age, if one of you did that, I would hope that I would welcome a dialogue and we could discuss what was wrong with my theology and have a differing picture. Because I think in many ways we are in a time when there is uncertainty, when there are more questions about who we are as a church, or questions about the institutions in society. We're questioning many things around government and around finance and corporations, around nonprofits and charities, and how these institutions are serving or not serving us 
So there's a great flux. How are we responding in this time of emergency? So on this anniversary Sunday, I don't know what the future of the church will be. But what I do know is that the deep message and the deep questioning, the yearning to understand spirit in our lives will continue as we, as people of faith, seek to unravel these questions, seek to understand how God is alive to us in this time and this place. So we might be amidst many changes and being faithful is being open to these questions, being discerning, being challenging, just as Jesus and the disciples challenged the status quo many centuries ago, we too are called into this time of questioning. So on this anniversary Sunday, let us remember this history of being together as God's people in this time, this place, and doing our work into the future. May it be so. Let us come into a time of prayer together. Let us pray. In the spirit of loving togetherness, we come together on this anniversary Sunday to give thanks and to be open how, to how the spirit is moving amongst us 
in this 189th year. We give thanks for the long tradition of people gathering as St. Paul's through many generations and many times, through ups and downs, through times of crisis, through times of former pandemics, through times of war, through times of celebration, through times of reaching out to the community in a variety of ways. So we give thanks for all who have faithfully served this community, who have questioned God's purpose in the world and sought to be God's people in a variety of ways and means and through their pushing of questions and opening doors to new opportunities. So we give thanks for this anniversary of us being your people in, even in these challenging times. We pray for those who are facing suffering and illness. We pray for our, that our prayers may surround them with love and comfort and caring, even as they struggle with the uncertainties of this disease. We offer prayers of thanks for all who help, for the many people in the service industries who allow us, other people, to stay at home, who put themselves in harm's way in order to service our needs, and particularly those folks in seniors' homes who are working with a vulnerable population. We give thanks for all they do, and we ask that out of this time, new recognition for their service and work can be recognized. We give thanks for all those in the healthcare system, from the people who clean the hospitals, through the nurses and doctors and orderlies, the whole medical team who is responding to this crisis as well as our regular medical needs. So we give thanks for all who offer service. We pray that each one of us may reach out with kindness and caring for those in our community and our prayers extend around the world as we, a human community, respond to these changing times and understanding the nature of this disease and what it means for us, how it challenges us to think differently about our interrelatedness with the planet and with animals and with all of our atmosphere, our water, our air, our land, the energy we use. May this time be one of evaluation and caring and hope and changed ways so that we may seek a sustainable future for all of us. In all of these prayers, we ask that we too may be cared for, that our hopes may be recognized, our fears may be addressed, that we are embraced with the divine spirit of love that holds us from here to the future in all times, in all eternity. We pray these our prayers. Amen. <laughs> Let 
is from Luke uh, 24 verses 13 to 35 the walk to Emmaus now on that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all these things that had happened while they were talking and discussing Jesus himself came near and went with them but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. 
And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So we went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scripture to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together, they were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. So welcome, Bill, in this crazy time of virtual connection. It's nice to see you, at least, and uh, to welcome you to St. Paul's. We were going to have you in person, but uh, we do in kind through this video uh, chat. So it's lovely to uh, be able to reflect with you on the biblical message and to uh, celebrate this 189th year uh, for St. Paul's and its work. So over to you and uh, welcome. Well, uh, good morning, Ted. It's it's good to see you. I wish I was I was there. And now I prepared uh, my 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 comments, so I'm just going to plunge right in. And uh, but just say realize that uh, I think this is a great opportunity. So good morning from uh, my dining room here in Calgary to to your homes in Aurelia. Uh, it's amazing for especially me. I'm a techno peasant. And it's amazing for me to use this magic of online technology. Uh, and I'm delighted to celebrate your, uh, now I saw somewhere 186 years and you say 189. So I wish you'd get your actual age correct, you know, but anyway, you're old yes. and, and, that's, and that's good. I'm sorry not to be there with you on my uh, annual visit. What has been really an annual visit to be with you and to share your, your marvelous 21st century story. I, I always love coming to Aurelia and seeing, uh, seeing the people and seeing what you're doing. Just think, 
you were born, uh, when you were born, uh, 200 people lived in Aurelia. And apparently there were four stores, three taverns, two blacksmith shops, four shoemakers, two furniture makers, a tailor, a tannery, and a church. Quite a pioneer community. But then your story reaches back long before that, thousands of years before that, when indigenous people, including the Huron and Iroquois, lived in the land. So you've had a long, long story and you're still going. Uh, I love the ways actually in which uh, you are celebrating and honoring uh, the long history of humankind where Aurelia and St. Paul's now stand. It's a wonderful story. And just think actually of all the different ways that people uh, with St. Paul's have sought to be faithful since 1834 or 1832 or whatever your actual date was, every generation, each generation in your journey has taken a lot of risks in a variety of ways, different ways, uh, in a, trying to be faithful to God's peace, justice, compassion, and, and love. Uh, and by the way, you should know that I enjoy telling your story wherever I go. I say, you should see what's going on at St. Paul's in, in Aurelia. It's an inspiring story, and I love telling it. Well, I think we all know that anniversaries give us time to pause and uh, contemplate the future, not just the past. And actually, COVID-19 has given us pause in ways we never could have imagined a forced retreat, if you will. And uh, you have exercised your imagination in the use of your building and, and other resources. Uh, where will your faithful imagination take you next? You've done some terrific things in the last while. Where are you gonna go next? This is an exciting time for all of us and for you at St. Paul's. You are crafting, actually, uh, an amazing legacy for generations to come. And people are watching, people like me are watching and cheering you on. Uh, your faith has led to risk taking and uh, I for one am looking forward to the next chapter in your very compelling story. Talking about stories, I love the Emmaus story. There's a number of stories in the Bible which I go back to over and over again, which I love. And this is, this is one of them. It's really pretty simple, actually. Two of Jesus' disciples, after the amazing events in Jerusalem, his crucifixion and resurrection and so on, two of Jesus' disciples are walking along to go to a place called Emmaus, when we don't know if that's a real place or not. But anyway, that's where they're going. And um, they're joined by a stranger. And even in conversation with the stranger, they failed to recognize that this stranger actually was Jesus himself. It was only in the breaking of bread, the sharing of a meal, that they recognized him. How many times have we been in that situation where something that's right in front of us, we can't see it? You remember those uh, tests they used to do with drawings and they'd say now find the face in the drawing and you'd look at it look at it look at it and couldn't see it and then when you did see it oh you couldn't see anything else from from then on well that happens to us a lot something is right in front of us and we don't recognize it well when they shared a meal something very simple and yet extremely important uh, the veil was lifted and they recognized Jesus. There was clarity, there was companionship, and there was community in that act. Well, COVID-19 has lifted a number of veils uh, for us. We are seeing certain things much differently than uh, we did even three, two or three months ago. I'm just gonna name a few of them, for example. The conditions in many elder care homes, especially, homes for, for poor people. The wages and the working conditions of people who plant and harvest the food we eat and on which we depend. The wages of people who care for the very young and very old. 
the skill and quality of teachers. I, I'm on a whole bunch of Zoom meetings and quite often there's young parents and they're saying, boy, am I ever thankful for my kids' teachers. <laughs> they're realizing it's a tough job. And so that, that's lifting that veil. Another one is how interdependent we are, not just in Canada, but globally, very interdependent in so many ways. And how much cleaner is our air and water and so on. People are expressing amazement all over the world because of the, you know, the cut down in air travel, cars, manufacturing, and so on. Now, many of us are hoping that we will not go back to business as usual or, or so-called normal. Uh, we don't want to be that elastic band that goes like this and then snaps back and you never knew anything happened. People are talking about a different vision, a different framework, if you will, for our economics, our politics, our social life, and so on. A different way of looking at the world, a different way of organizing how we live together. Now, all of you know that Ted and I are encouraged that people are asking about eco-commoning. It's a funny phrase, but you're getting used to it a little bit. And people actually are asking us about that. And we're doing webinars and so on about it. What does it look like? Is St. Paul's sort of a demonstration of one way in, in which uh, eco-commoning is being expressed? Uh, there's lots of stuff going on. And people are curious and saying we can't go back to where we were. I believe that this is our time. This is the moment of truth-telling, of lifting of veils, of recognizing the essential conditions and contributions of faith communities to our common life. I know that people are looking for spiritual and ethical leadership. Um, I've been giving my talk on the spirituality and ethics of, of climate crisis for quite a while. And it's very interesting how people in all walks of life in different organizations, from teachers' federations to, uh, to the city council to businesses as well as churches, are asking now more than they did even a year ago for what we have to say about the ethics and spirituality of the crisis we are in. Just this week, I gave the keynote talk to the uh, Calgary Climate Hub, and that was the topic uh, that I talked about. Uh, so I am no longer surprised, as I once was, that people want to hear the voice of faith communities and the spirituality and ethics we bring to these things. Because people know in their heart and increasingly even in their mind, that we are at a spiritual and ethical crossroads and faith communities are essential. You have already captured the imagination of Aurelia and beyond. You have been faithful and your faithful imagination ignited by seeing differently, by being seeing things differently, has provided what we're calling a new framework a new vision for being and acting in the world, a worldview rooted in the biblical story of ancient communities recognizing and living God's hope and love for the world. I'm almost finished here, but I want to give you a quote that some of you may have heard. I probably used it every time I come to St. Paul's because it, it, it always inspires me, and it's something that Al Gore wrote quite a few years ago, but it's relevant right now. This is just a portion of it. He says this, this crisis is bringing us an opportunity to experience what few generations in history ever have the privilege of knowing, a generational mission the acceleration of a compelling moral purpose, a shared and unifying cause. Now this, this is the one that I always think is great. The thrill of being forced by circumstances to put aside 
the pettiness and conflict that so often stifle the restless human need for transcendence. The opportunity to rise. Well, that's what you are doing. That's what those of us who, who care about the world and are rooted in our faith are trying to do. And we are being compelled, whether we like it or not, to this thrilling journey of creating a new framework for how we live, how we live together. The last sentence goes to Mary Oliver, a wonderful poet who died over a year ago. And she summarizes a lot of things very, very well in her beautiful poetry. She says this, and I leave you with this. The only question is how to love the world. So be it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for those inspiring words. As usual, you summarize the zeitgeist of where we are in this day and age. And I uh, appreciate the encouragement that you give to me personally and to St. Paul's on our journey of uh, opening ourselves to question and to spirit, and to that spirit of love that Mary Oliver invites us into. So thank you for being with us in this virtual way. Great to be here. Thank you for inviting me.
with thanksgiving, we have gathered on this anniversary Sunday. We've appreciated the words from Bill. We've prayed together. We've opened ourselves to what it means to be God's people in this time, this age, and this time of emergency. May we be blessed by the creative spirit of love that surrounds us. May we walk with friend Jesus along the path of uncertainty. May we be embraced by the spirit of love that holds, encourages us, and gives us hope. May it be so. Amen.